Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andy Thompson, and I'm a research fellow at UCL just down the road. Um, and thank you for the introduction. As 2019 is the year of carbon, tracing how carbon moves through the earth is clearly a topic of interest. So, um, trying to uh, beginning this talk and thinking about what the Earth's deep carbon cycle is, there's a beautiful poster in the library describing Earth's surface carbon cycle, which uh, shows how carbon is transferred between the various reservoirs on the surface of the Earth, the oceans, the atmosphere, and the hydrosphere. Whereas the Earth's deep carbon cycle is um, how the surface reservoirs uh, connect themselves to the interior of the Earth. So, your Earth is unique because Unlike the other planets we know of in detail, it has downgoing uh, mass transfer of volatile species via uh, tectonic convection and subduction of the oceanic crust, uh, which allows volatile species from the surface to be brought inside the Earth. So not only is there degassing of carbon in volcanoes, diffuse degassing and at mid-ocean ridges expelling CO2 to the atmosphere, the Earth can modulate its climate over geological time by taking some of that carbon in the oceanic crust and passing it back into the Earth via subduction. So here is a schematic which shows estimates of the mass flow of carbon via the various uh, portions. So there's outgassing and ingassing, uh, and the, the mass fluxes are estimated via paper a couple of years ago. And the question I really want to address throughout the rest of this talk is how much and how does the carbon being subducted deep inside the Earth, so that's beyond the sub arc environment, which perhaps just comes straight back out, our arc volcanoes, how does that behave? And uh, as the estimates in this paper suggested, between none and almost all of the carbon that's subducted into the arc environment goes beyond that one or 200 kilometers into the deep mantle. So how I did this was I looked at some natural diamonds that come from Brazil. So sitting on the west edge of the Amazon Craton, is the Juina town and the Juina region, which is famous for producing these diamonds which come from deep inside the Earth. So every black dot on this map is a kimberlitic uh, volcanic deposit, which was Cretaceous in age. And the diamonds that I'm studying here are pictures of three of them. Uh, they're broken, they're not gems, you wouldn't wear them as a ring, but they have lots of interesting information held within, inside them. Um, so what we do first is we take them and we polish them on a jeweler's wheel to expose a flat surface, which we can study via various techniques to make analyses at different parts of the diamond to tell different things about what's going on. And uh, these are cathode luminescence images. So the different gray scale shows the concentration of a defect in the diamond structure, which highlights the growth history that they experience. So you can see this one here shows concentric layers of growth around a central nucleus. Uh, on this slide, the numbers represent the isotopic carbon composition at different points in the diamond. And I'd like to draw your attention to the black areas in the diamond. Those are silicate mineral inclusions that are trapped within those diamonds. And it's those inclusions that provide us most of the information that allow us to track how these diamonds formed and where they came from in the deep earth. Uh, so here are some backscatter electron images of several of the inclusions that we studied. Um, so in, this, uh, in a backscatter electron image, the brightness of grayscale corresponds proportionally to the density of the material that's being imaged. So brighter colors means that portion of the inclusion is made up of heavier elements. Uh, so bright colors here mean that it's made up of iron uh, dominated elements, whereas uh, less bright colors means it's maybe magnesium or silicon instead, more enriched. Uh, the scale bar in each image is 10 microns in size, so these inclusions are only 20 to 50 microns in diameter. So they're very tiny, very hard to see with the naked eye. Um, but you can see that there's a, a wide variety of different types, and you can also see that they are all made up of multiple mineral phases. So they're all polyphase inclusions. However, we don't interpret them as polyphase inclusions because seeing a coazite coexisting with a kyanite mineral is not something we'd expect anywhere in the regular Earth. What we do instead is we add back together all the components inside each inclusion and interpret them as an inclusion which is retrogressed from an originally high pressure product back into its uh, low pressure stable assemblage. So they were trapped within the diamond at depth in the earth and they retrogress back to a low pressure phase assemblage on uh, eruption to the surface. So these ones in the blue box actually correspond to a bulk composition which matches that of Bridgmanite or magnesium silicate perovskite, the dominant mineral throughout the lower mantle. There are also garnet inclusions which come from depth in the earth because they have a large majorite components, so that indicates what pressure they came from. There's inclusions that are alkali-rich, 
which we interpret as former CF or NAL phases, these weird phases up here in this phase diagram. There's lots of these calcium silicate phases, which we interpret to have originally been calcium silicate perovskite, a phase which is stable from about 600 kilometers depth in the Earth down to the core mantle boundary. But the common thing about all of these inclusions is if we take them together, they completely make up the um, high pressure phase uh, diagram for basalt at high pressure. So basalt is what forms the oceanic crust. So we interpret these inclusions just based on their chemistry to show that they were formed from subducted crust that was taken into the earth and somehow turned into diamonds. So if I next look at, with those spots that were on the cathode luminescence images, the isotopic composition of carbon that makes up the diamond which they're trapped in, this red histogram shows the average mantle composition of carbon in the Earth. It's very heavily dominated by values of minus five, whereas the diamonds I analyzed with these inclusions are very heavily skewed towards light isotopic carbon compositions. Light isotopic carbon is a very strong indicator that they're formed from organic carbon formed in crustal environments, so that's not necessarily biotic organic carbon. You can also form light organic carbon via fischer tropsch reactions of degassing CO2 at mid-ocean ridges, interacting with hydrogen that's give, given off uh, during serpentinization of the oceanic floor. So this is a first indicator or another indicator that the diamonds are related to subducted crustal material. If we go on to look at the oxygen isotopic composition of the inclusions themselves, so those are silicate minerals which contain oxygen. Now, this green histogram is the same as the red histogram on the previous slide, so that's the average mantle carbon composition. On the y-axis, you've now got the blue histogram is the oxygen isotopic composition of mantle peridotitic xenoliths that have erupted in cretonic environments. And you can see that the diamonds are heavier isotopically in oxygen than the average cretonic composition in oxygen, as well as lighter in carbon. So they sit over here in this unique quadrant, different from what we believe the average mantle to be. And it so happens that if you uh, hyd hydraulically alter the oceanic floor, then you'd expect it to become heavier in oxygen. So this also ties in with the story that you've got an altered oceanic crust subducting into the Earth. We can go on further and look at the trace element geochemistry of the inclusions trapped within the diamonds. So here are those calcium silicate perovskite inclusions again. And now I'm plotting the trace element abundance of different elements in the inclusions relative to the average composition of the bulk silicate Earth. So if it was just a portion of a calcium perovskite in a solid assemblage that was what you'd expect to be stable in the Earth uh, with no melt around, it would have a composition at most enriched that is this red dashed line, but more likely these green and blue dashed lines. So the fact is that the inclusions that we've observed fall in these um, colored bars. They're hugely enriched compared with the average composition expected in the solid Earth, um, up to 100,000 times more enriched than those you'd expect. And the only real way to do this is via crystallizing a melt which can concentrate those elements to very high amounts. So we've got inclusions that form from altered on its own crust that's melted deep inside the Earth. If you compare the melting curve of a carbonate-bearing oceanic crust with the temperature that subducting slabs are expected to have as they reach the um, transition zones, so that's three or 400 kilometers depth in the Earth's mantle, you can see that these, uh, the temperature of slabs will intersect the melting temperature of the carbonated oceanic crust material and produce a melt which crystallizes to diamond. Uh, we can reproduce this in experiments, seeing here that the composition of natural majoritic garnets in diamonds are the diamond symbols. The composition of uh, melts from carbonated basalts interacting with mantle overlying those things synthetically are the yellow circles, whereas they don't match the composition of garnets that you would see in solid phase assemblages without melt. So what we've got in this suite of diamonds from Juina is an entire story of the mantle carbon cycle in the upper mantle from alteration of the mid-oceanic crust, carbon subduction beyond the arc, melting in the transition zone about 400 to 600 kilometers depth as the solidus of carbonated oceanic crust intersects the temperatures of subducting slabs, 
and then some reaction which goes on here to reduce that carbon to diamond, and they somehow get back to the surface. And I'd like to finish there. Thank you. Hey, thanks very much. Yeah, that title is a little bit of a mouthful. Um, I asked if I should shorten it. I said, oh, no, no, it's fine. Um, so what really the title means is taking data that's already been generated in these provinces, collating it, re-evaluating it, performing new analysis on rock samples, and building a regional picture of the geological evolution of a region. So I work for Core Laboratories, which is a service company. So we do geological work for oil companies. Uh, my division is called Integrated Reservoir Solutions, and we build these regional reservoir uh, petroleum system uh, studies. So I'm going to introduce what one of these studies is, what it sort of includes, take a look at what geological data we pull into our databases, and I'm going to take you through one of my workflows of building a sedimentary log, how I build that into a regional correlation and end up with paleogeographical reconstructions of regions. So our studies compose of a number of different components, geological disciplines. So the one I work in is the sedimentological interpretation. So this is what the rocks look like. How can we determine how they were deposited in the region? So are they uh, beach sands? Are they deep marine turbiditic sands? Uh, trying to place them so we can start to rebuild the, the geological history. We have a group of petrographers who look at the rocks microscopically, who determine the structure, the reservoir quality, um, theorise about porosity permeabilities for uh, holding oil and gas. Uh, we have a team of stratigraphers who build our stratigraphic framework. So these look at each individual oil well, uh, produce a stratigraphic framework that ties them all together so we can correlate like-for-like -like intervals across uh, a large region. And then finally, those uh, disciplines are all gathered together and we produce our paleogeographic reconstructions. So this is really a series of maps that shows us exactly how the region developed over geological time. So this is looking at a sedimentary basin, seeing when the sedimentary basin opened, what sort of rocks are feeding into the system, how they change over time, and where companies can sort of help target their exploration efforts. So that map underneath shows uh, where our studies have taken place. Uh, since I've been working at Core Lab, uh, I've mainly been focused on uh, Western Africa and South America. So going back to Brazil, like the previous talk, uh, the study I'm currently working on is our Northeast Brazil study. So it's a study of five sedimentary basins, uh, looking, from the, looking at the Atlantic rifting, how the Atlantic opened, and how subsequent uh, sedimentation has produced reservoirs, uh, source rocks, and seals. So when I mentioned we harness legacy data, when a company drills an oil well, that drill bit produces cuttings. So when the drill bit goes down, the rocks that are drilled come back up as sort of like a gravel grade material. This material is collected at each depth. As the drilling is going down, it's termed cuttings. So I'm, I just put this in there to show, because I'm going to say cuttings quite a lot. And if you don't work in the oil industry, you might not have an idea of what these are and how important they can be. So companies also take cores sometimes. So in some of our wells in the study, we'll have cord intervals from different stratigraphic intervals. And we go and we describe these. So this is a cylinder of rock from the oil well. It could be five metres long, it could be 60 metres long, it could be a run of 200 metres long. And finally, they can also take sidewall cores. So this is where they drop a little tool down the well, and they either drill or blow a little uh, section of the rock out of the side, bring it back up, and we can look at the sedimentology of the, of the uh, rock at that interval. So what we do is we take that geological information and we tie it together with the wireline logs. So when, after you drilled an oil well, you drop your wireline tools down the hole, and these measure the uh, petrophysical properties of the rocks. And using these results, we can tie these in with the, uh, the lithological observations and start to get an idea of the sedimentary history for our oil wells. So I'm going to take you through a workflow of how we build one of these sedimentary logs. So this is, one of the, so this is a blank image of one of our logs to start with. And what we do is we start, we take our base data set and we load it into the sedimentary log. So there we've got our wireline logs and a very base, basic lithological column. So this is just highlighting uh, claystones and sandstones. So this is a 500 metre section from the bottom of one of those wells in that current northeast Brazil study. When we go back and start incorporating the other lithological data, so we look at cuttings descriptions, we go back and look at the cuttings descriptions ourselves to validate any descriptions. We look at the sidewall cores, we want to see 
what these rocks actually look like and tie these to our, our wildland logs. So when we're looking at these, we're looking at the grain sizes, so those sandstones. We're looking for any accessory minerals that, uh, that appear in those rocks that could help us gauge what sort of environment these rocks are being deposited in. Uh, are there any fossils noted? Uh, are there any oil and gas shows noted in our legacy reports? And can we determine any structure from our little sidewall cores? So you can see by putting in that information, we've already started to high grade some of the lithological interpretations. So where previously an interval was just described as a, as a medium grain sandstone, if you actually go back and look at the cuttings um, and the sidewall cores, we can see that the cuttings lied and the sidewall cores actually show us we're in a granular sand. But that granular sand has been beaten down by the, by the, in, through the drilling process and has made uh, the um, quartz grain smaller, which wasn't picked up at well site. So one of the most detailed parts of information where we get from the oil wells are these cord intervals. So we go into country and we log these cords ourselves. So we take all the wells in our study that could have been drilled by four or five different operators over the past 40 years, and we create a consistent core description for each of those cores. So when we're looking at the cores, here's an example again from this Northeast Brazil study. So this is a core that I logged in uh, Brazil last year. We're really looking at the diagnostic features that we can tell within these rocks that tell us exactly how these rocks were deposited. So we're looking for sedimentary structures uh, that we know were formed in one specific environment. We're looking more and more detail about what sort of minerals we've got in these rocks, and we're looking for fossils. So the fossils can be diagnostic of what sort of environment you're in, and we also look for ichnofossils. So ichnofossils are the traces that were left by these little critters. So in some areas where you don't see fossils, you don't get fossil preservation, you sometimes get preserved burrows. And if you know that this specific type of burrow was deposited in a lower shore face setting, you can start to place your sediments. Uh, we look for oil staining in the core. This core is actually oil stained. So this is what an oil stained core uh, sandstone looks like. And we look at how this changes through the system. So we've got this zone here, which we think has undergone patchy diagenesis. So we've got localized cement formation it's inhibiting oil getting into that section of rock compared to these more porous rocks uh, just slightly beneath it. And then again, we take that description and we build it into the sedimentary log. So this is really pulling together all the sedimentological information we can from the numerous different data types, uh, making new, new observations, uh, calibrating uh, the rocks to the logs, and producing new analyses as well. So whilst I'm siloed building these sedimentary logs, we also have our petrographers and our stratigraphers that build data into these products. So our petrographers take these petrographic fin sections, and what they're looking for is really to give us a lot of more detail about how these rocks are made, um, what minerals are they made of, uh, the microscopic structures in these rocks, and overall we're looking at the reservoir quality. So how well could these rocks hold oil? How well... Could they not hold oil? Uh, are we getting any localised cement formations? Are the minerals in these rocks going to cause a problem if these rocks are buried deeper where a company might be looking for oil? And then concurrently, our stratigraphers are building this stratigraphic framework. So they tell us how old these rocks that we're looking at are. So this will become apparent in a couple of slides' time where I'm going to pull it all together and show you a regional correlation. But they also give us some information on some of the microfossils. If we know where these microfossils, what environments they like to live in, we can uh, start to infer what deposition environment we might be looking at. So after we've pulled all of that data together from lots of these different disciplines, uh, we have the most accurate representation of the well that we can possibly get sedimentologically from the data available. Uh, from this point, we start to make our environmental interpretations, which is done by colouring in this column here. So what this does is pulls it together. So what does, this, what does the data that we have indicate for the environment that these rocks were deposited in? And these rocks are actually extremely deep water uh, turbolite systems that are being taken out through a canyonized system in northeast Brazil, delivering these sands much deeper than you would anticipate. Uh, just to give you an idea of how large the scope of these projects can be, this is a 500 meter section. Uh, the current project we're looking at has 190,000 metres of lithological succession that has to be integrated, interpreted, and output. So once we've got the data for each individual well, we build it into these regional correlations. We start to look at the age, the rock type, and the environment, and how this changes across the region over time. So if we know we've got oil in one interval down here, we can look across our cross-sections and say, oh, we've got another sand here, 
Does that have sand? In it? Does that have oil in it? Is it the same sandstone? And that ultimately culminates in building these predictive environmental maps. So this is a cycle through. So this is a, a map for each stratigraphic package, and it shows you where we see rocks are deposited in different environments and how they change over geological time. And we use this to try and predict environments of, for deposition of rocks where we could see oil where people may have not um, explored yet. So thank you. So hopefully I showed you how we collate and evaluate this data uh, by harnessing exist an existing data set that often is just abandoned in a warehouse somewhere, and how we interpret our sedimentological trends and build a regional depositional model. Thank you. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wesley Dixon. I am a geotechnical engineer at Watson Structural Source Limited. And over the next 10 minutes, I know how to sit back, relax, and enjoy how the use of electronic tablets and optical televiewers can be used as login aids. With that, I'll be using examples from War for Ground Investigations as well as my own personal experience. So I'll go through what um, I intend to present today. Uh, we'll start at the beginning, what Wilfer is and why it's relevant. I'll then move on to the ground investigation stages that we usually go through, from drilling the boreholes to logging it and to using the tablets and televiewers. I'll briefly touch on the limitations of technology, then I'll finish with a summary and um, key points to take home with you. So first and foremost, what is Wilfer? For anyone who's been um, reading the news recently or you just recognise the image on the title slide, you'll know that Wilfer is a nuclear power station. There's a pre-existing one and proposed one and it's located here in Anglesey in North Wales. It's basically one of eight nuclear power stations that the government has commissioned to be built in order to replace the ones that were constructed in the 1960s and 70s. Wilfer, in general, the original one, was constructed here in 1971 and decommissioned in 2015. The new Wilfer, which is proposed to be here, has had um, various contractors, including structural saws, working there since 2007, drilling hundreds, and I literally mean hundreds of boreholes, in order to uh, determine the ground conditions anywhere between 10 metres to 200 metres deep. And to do that, we use the two main rigs, as you can see here, the blue one, a cable rig, uh, to go through saw, and the red one, the rotor rig, in order to drill through rock. So once the borehole is drilled, the next stage is to flush the hole. And what I mean by flushing a hole is basically to pump water into it and up out of it to clean it out. So to use that, we use one of these, an intermediate bulk container, or an IBC for sure. These hold um, around about 1,000 litres of water and are able to connect to the rig. So if we imagine that we've got a borehole here that's around about 100 metres, we basically pump fresh water into the borehole. And as we pump fresh water in, we get the murky water and with the suspended sediment being pumped out. The more fresh water we pump into the borehole, the more of the murky water and sediment comes out until we pump so much fresh water in the hole that we get the water running clear as it's coming out. And when this happens, that's when you know that the hole is flushed properly. Now, if you're lucky, it will only take around about one IBC to flush the hole. However, if you're unlucky, and it happens to be a Friday, you find that no matter what you do, no matter how many IBCs you put down the hole, the water will not run clear. No matter how annoying this is, you have to make sure that you flush the hole properly. And when I get onto the limitations of technology section, I will show you why that's the case. So assuming that the hole is flushed properly, we move on to the next stage, using an optical televiewer, which is one of these. It consists of a computer, and a camera which is attached to an, opti attached to an optical fibre. The camera in cross-section looks like this with a conical mirror so it can take 360 degree photos. And ladies and gentlemen, I apologise for this next part because I tried and I tried to find a diagram of this online, I couldn't. And you can probably see there's a reason why I'm a geologist and not an artist, but here we go. So let's assume this borehole is 100 metres deep, we have our engineer lowering the camera down, all the while taking images of it, that's stored in the computer. And once it's done, we get something like this, an optical televiewer image. With this, we see the two main rock types we see the, um, that we find in Wilfer. We see the Samite, which is Precambrian to Cambrian metamorphic sandstone, and we see Philite, which is Precambrian to Cambrian metamorphic slate. There is another rock group, the Guna group, which is a Tabitic sandstone, which isn't as common as Samite and Philite, which we also find in North Wales. However, I don't have an optical image of this. And just like with the flush, I will get onto why that is the case with the limitations of technology section. So the hole's been drilled, the hole's been flushed, and the hole has had the optical televiewer down it. The next stage is for us engineers to physically log the core that comes out the ground. And to do that, we were using one of these, um, a Panasonic Tough Pad, and the software that we used was P-Log, which is a bit like hole base or Jint. 
the um, agreement that we had with the client was that we weren't to start logging the physical core until we received the optical televiewers so we could compare and contrast what was there in real time. And I'll show you what I mean with this next slide. I think the best way to log core, and I'll use this as an example, is to find the most obvious boundary. So in this case, at 19.70 metres, we've got a fillet band coming in, but that's from the driller's depths. However, when we get our optical televiewer image of the same hole, we see the depth is actually at 19.60 metres. Now, in this situation, I'd be thinking, well, in that case, which depth do I go for? And you always go with the optical televiewer image because this has been calibrated to be accurate to um, 10 millimetres. Whereas for the driller to measure the hole, they usually have a weighted tape measure that they put down the hole. So when in doubt, go for the optical televiewer image. So why we use the technology, I think probably the most important point is it improves the accuracy and the reliability of the logs, but that's not it. Using the tablets, it saves on paper, it saves on printing, and it also saves time because when you have a lot of people writing stuff on paper, inevitably the paper's going to end up getting lost. A bit of audience participation. Who here thinks that says true? Who thinks this is false? And who has absolutely no idea? <laughs> point I'm trying to make is that when you do stuff on tablets, you don't have issues with the handwriting. In addition to that, the P-Log technology that we were using had um, a lot of drop-downs as opposed to free text. So there was consistency within the logs. This is especially good if you had people that were new to logging or not familiar with it. So even if you had 10 people logging the same hole, the idea is that with consistency, it looks as though only one person's doing it because the style is the same. So another example of how we can use the televiewer images. We've got more core here, and once again, we think, OK, I'll get um, the televiewer image up. And you can see at 75 and a half metres, we've got the obvious uh, fill out band with quartz, but um, hold on, no, physical core, we don't have that yet. Now, when this originally happened, I admit it confused me a bit. So like any sane person, I listened to some Lionel Richie, and it was only when I was halfway through Hello that I realised the universe was probably trying to tell me something Lo and behold, the driller had simply put the core in the box back to front. So, of course, nothing's perfect, and there are limitations with the technology. Um, with this one in particular, this core was in a shear zone. So because of that, we weren't able to get a decent image because of how non-intact it was. And that's how comes we couldn't also get an image of the Guna group. So that's also quite a weathered non-intact rock. In this case, it wasn't too bad, as we have the quartz veins here. So we're still able to match up where we should have been in the ground. Also remember how I said it's really important to flush a borehole even if you have an infinite amount of IBCs going down the hole. This is the reason why. We can still see at 80 metres there's a quartz vein here, but you can also see that the optical televiewer image is a brown colour because of all the suspended sediment. So this hole clearly hasn't been flushed properly, and as you get deeper and deeper and deeper into the hole, that looks less like a televiewer image and more like um, laminate flooring that you'd find in carpet, right? <laughs> now, with this, it's a waste of time, it's a waste of money, and the client probably isn't going to be too happy, which segues nicely onto my next section about unhappy clients, time constraints. Now, again, in order to log the stuff the way we did, we first had to have the borehole drilled, obviously. It then had to be flushed, which takes around about a day. You need to leave it another day to settle. After that, you then have to have that image sent to us, we can take um, another day. All in all, you're sometimes looking at four or five days from when the physical core comes out the ground to when we can start logging it. And with that time, you've got the client that wants that information there and then because you have tight deadlines and large projects like this. I personally think it's worth waiting for that to happen so you can log it more accurately than rushing through and trying to correct afterwards. But that's just my opinion. And with that, I'll summarise what I've gone through today. Using the tablets and the televiewers together can improve the accuracy and the reliability of the logs. If you're going to flush a borehole, do it properly. There are limitations within the technology, although some of them are avoidable, i.e. flushing the hole properly. And anyone interested in this line of work, it is a lot of work, but also can be a lot of fun. And with that, I will finish with one of my favourite images from the job. This is the warehouse where we stored all the core. I mean, well, for there's probably about 13 and a half kilometres of core there. I, at this point, had logged three and a half kilometres, and I think it's fair to say that it's probably enough for a lifetime. <laughs> so thank you for listening, and are there any questions? Thank you very much. For OK, so, uh, my name's Sam Hazel. I currently work at Arup in the geotechnics team. I have done for about three years. Um, so there's a quick agenda of what I'll be going through today, background into the scheme I'm working on, and then the criteria and resources we use to analyse what walkovers we would go on, 
and then just a few site visits, a few case study examples, before finally a few conclusions and summary. So for anyone that doesn't know, the project is HS2, uh, HS2 2B, so this is the eastern leg on the, obviously on the eastern side, um, running up from Tib Shelf onto the eastern side of Sheffield and up towards Leeds. Um, as everyone probably knows, it's one of the biggest infrastructure projects in the UK. Um, the site itself is, I've defined as a 130 kilometer linear site. In fairness, it's much wider than that, much bigger because the earthworks alone can extend for tens of meters each side. We have depots and spurs and other little bits of work, but in case of this, we'll call it 130 kilometers. It goes through a complex region, both geologically and historically, um, predominantly through the coal measures, lower, middle, and upper, a um, little bit of Permian, but also along with the coal measures, we have a rich history of mining. The project itself, while most people regard it as a railway project, is very multidiscipline. We've got input from ecology, environmental team, structural, you name it, there's probably something there. So to target the walkovers, the first thing we need to do is identify risk. You can identify risk in many, many different ways. HS2 have many ways of identifying and classifying risk. But in terms of this, I've broken it down into engineering risk and operational and logistical risk. So within my engineering risks, I've got instability, historical mine workings, um, and, so, and then geology and unforeseen ground conditions. Operational and logistical risk might include wider environment, existing structures, physical barriers, things that might prevent the scheme from being developed successfully. So what we need to do is create a priority list. As I said, it's 130 kilometers. It's a massive site. Um, we need to narrow that down. So how do we decide where to go? What can we actually hope to gain? There'll be places that everyone wants to go. Ideally, we'd go everywhere. We'd walk every square meter, but simply we're not going to have time. It's going to be too expensive, and it's also going to be very tiring. Um, so to do that, we've reviewed a wide number of sources. One of the jumping off points was to analyze the topography of the route. So we got all the OS maps together and looked through the entire route, found all of the prominent features, anywhere of interest that might create, what should we say, a, a dramatic landscape. Um, this combined with all the relevant geohazard data uh, allowed us to target specific areas. And then using items such as LIDAR, we were able to um, concentrate our search and focus on these. Items such as the landslides database also provided a great insight and allowed us to completely target specific areas and visit um, with guidance. Uh, one of the main sources we used was the Coal Authority. They provided us with a wealth of data, including um, unlicensed open cast areas, areas of probable working, but also conveniently seam outcrop and mine entries. So as I said, it's through the Pennine coal measures. It's a very heavily worked area, so it'll give us a really good idea of where these items are. And also abandonment plans so that we can actually ascertain how big an open cast site might be or the actual licensed area. But what really ties it all together is the geology. So again, using different sources, online resources, the old maps, memoirs, everything we could get our hands on previous test studies of the year, it might have intercepted with. We brought this all together along with the Coal Authority data. I managed to create some long sections for the entire route. Uh, this is one I created myself. It's very early draft, so I'm, I already know there's bits on there that's incorrect, and we've got some much more evolved ones. And uh, using like the coal seam data, we were able to plot these quite accurately and create them for the entire route. So after we've gone through this, we've settled on five locations, oh, sorry, 15. Um, so th these have engineering and access significance. We've also managed to rule out areas where we might not get any extra data. Um, what would we actually get from going there? Um, so th and we've also put in a widespread coverage of locations so that the entire route is included. So the next thing we need to do is produce a schedule of visits. Like, it's a very big site, multiple landowners, 
and each of these lambdas would have to be contacted. So we come on to my first case study, which is instability. So as you can see in the photo, we've got some evidence of rotational slip going down the hillside. Um, the landowner here has cut the toe away for the access track, probably not making things any better. In other areas, we found evidence of translational slips with a number of trees showing compensation for the movement. These trees were found to be on very shallow rockhead. A few of them had already fallen, exposing the roots and the, um, the weathered rock below and revealed a very, very thin topsoil. So I said that instability brought us sort of to this location from the resources that we'd reviewed previously. But interestingly, when we got here, we found that the landowner that probably cut that toe away had also completely landscaped the entire area. This used to be a massive hill, <laughs> and on the OS maps, still was a massive hill. But when we got there, there are probably about 15 fishing ponds that he's created in this sort of stepped platform um, into the hillside. So it's sort of a cut and fill replace method. Um, but absolutely no evidence of this prior. Luckily for us, uh, the geologists on site, he'd exposed a number of coal seams and weathered shale outcrops. Um, so it was a good opportunity for us to go and actually look what the geology was in the area and make some observations. Um, so this is just a blank map that we took out, just making field notes. And within three hours of being there, we'd made quite a number of, in, um, of notes. So all of these here are the ponds that we identified. So I'm probably getting a little bit excited going back to sort of my mapping days, getting the chance to do some intricate line work again. But it was absolutely staggering how much the landscape had changed. Okay, so the next engineering risk I mentioned was historical mining. Um, so moving a bit further north, I think this is near Mexpra. Um, we arrived on site, and the first thing we see is this, which, as far as I'm aware, is a mineshaft cap, but one designed for methane monitoring. And from the database of mine entries, we were able to locate that. It's the one that appeared in the blue circle over there. So it's a pretty good indication to start off that you're in the right place. Within the area, we found potential evidence of shallow mining, small cuts and worked faces, hummocky localised depressions, and productive coal seams at crop. Possibly small bell pits in the area, and also evidence of localised working of the Mexper rock, which is a good building sandstone. One of the landowners flagged to my attention a sinkhole on his land. Now, as I've mentioned, it's um, mostly coal measures. So a sinkhole is probably not likely, maybe a collapsed mine shaft. So he'd identified this hole with this little white flag. So he went over to have a little look. And I, I wasn't convinced initially. It's a fairly deep hole, but it kind of just looks a bit like a fence post being removed. So we're getting ready to sort of dismiss that. So we're walking away, and just completely by chance, out the corner of my eye, I see a glimmer of sort of water and it's this little hole. So I look down, and lo and behold, there's another little hole here, which completely opens up into sort of like a bell-shaped chamber filled with water. And I feel almost foolish, like, standing there putting that ruler in, thinking, oh, this is probably a collapsed mine shaft now. Because, <laughs> like, we couldn't touch the bottom of that thing. Um, but, yeah, fascinating what you find. And again... The final one are geological features. So this is a permanent escarpment. So this is where the coal measures meets an unconformity and then goes on to the KP formation. So we get quite an elevation change over a short distance of time. I think it goes up by almost 100 metres over, over less than a kilometre. And as you can see, we get a very dramatic landscape looking south, very open and flat, ideal for wind turbines to the north. What brought us to this area was the geological exposures. So it gave us some good chance to analyse these outcrops. But interestingly, we'd also noticed on the Natural Cavities database the presence of a Vados cave, not directly impacting the alignment, but just slightly off. So we managed to actually find this cave, and then traversing the escarpment, the same geological boundary, managed to find some more caves, potentially. And so that's my examples. 
And then, so for a summary, we get, had a broad insight into the scheme in the area, confirmed the presence of identified risks, managed to remove or reduce the implied risks, identified new features and new evidence, gave us good experience, and also team building, a very diverse team from different companies. It's also relatively quick and affordable. But the highlight for me was that of these 15 priority sites, the data we, conclude, we got, um, HS2 then instructed us to conduct further sites. So from this initial 15, we've just short of 40 now. And uh, I think they're scheduling a few more soon. Thank you very much. Hi everybody, my name's Erin Guy and I'm an engineering geologist for Jacobs in Leeds and today I'm going to be talking to you about a new school development which is located in the Durham Coldfield. So just as a bit of an overview, um, Jacobs were provided with a desk study report that had been produced by the ground investigation contractor and we were re reassured by the client we could use this document in good faith to go forward. So we were tasked by the client with producing a ground investigation specification based on what that desk study report included. Uh, providing technical supervision of a ground investigation for the new school and then also producing a report of the uh, ground investigation findings and any recommendations. So the site is located in Bowburn in County Durham which is about five miles southeast of uh, Durham there just off the A1 so I've circled the site there with thread. Essentially it was a new school in the uh, school field of the existing school so they're going to like build both and then knock the school down to, and use the field for um, the playground. So the being located on a coal field, the aims of the ground investigation were to determine the depth of the superficial deposits and also the thickness and elevation of the coal seams beneath the site. And I've included these two pictures just to show the hazardous nature of developing on ground on coal field land. Um, and the reason I've included these two is because it shows what can happen quickly, i.e. overnight, but also slowly and over time and how it's different. So just to give a bit of an overview of what bourbon has been like, I've got some historical maps here, and you can see we've got old shafts, pit houses, but what I think is really interesting on that second picture there is we've got bourbon Colliery, which has been linked to the regional railway line with the second railway. So what that tells me is there's obviously a significant amount of coal has come out of the ground in this area in order to warrant putting in that link to the regional railway line. So if we look at the geological map of the site, the superficial deposits at our site were glacial till. So a borehole in the area indicated that the depth to these deposits was about six metres. There wasn't a lot of coverage in the area, so that was all we had to go off. So the geology underneath the site, though, was the Pennine Middle Coal Measure. So I've got the site highlighted in red there. And as you can see, to the northeast of the site, the FQ, that is the five quarters coal seam, that is located stratigraphically above in our section, so we weren't looking to encounter that. We've got the main coal seam running right through the middle of the site. And to the southeast, we've got the Maudlin coal seam. In between the main and the Maudlin, you can see there's a busty coal seam, but that's been washed out, so we're not anticipating to encounter that. There is faulting in the area, but nothing in close proximity to our site, so nothing that should upset the ground model. And just as a note, the regional dip um, of the geology is four degrees to the northeast. So if I was to produce a schematic cross-section just based on what the destiny report indicated to us, we're looking for shallow uh, superficial deposits overlying uh, multiple coal seams. So the desk study indicated we should encounter the main coal seams, so that was the one running directly through the site, at about 14 metres, and a thickness for that was given at about 1.16 metres. The Maudlin, we were told, would be within about 30 metres, however, we weren't given a thickness for that. The desk study report also indicated there were two unnamed coal seams in between these two, which were indicated on the geological map. However, they weren't noted on the 1 to 50,000 map, and that was all we had to go off. So we were told we could reuse this report by the client, so if that's what we thought we were going to get, this is what we went to site thinking we were going to find. So this is just a borehole location plan. As you can see, the grey building on the left is the existing school and our proposed development. What we are interesting, uh, investigating is the orange development. So it mainly comprised 10 window sample holes. They were mainly specified by our contaminated land team just to determine the extent and thickness of made ground. We had trial pits for soak away testing. As you can appreciate with the site being underlain by glacial till, there was a bit of an issue with flooding. But the main thing we were interested in were these four 30 metre boreholes, which were specified to determine those uh, elevation and thickness of those coal seams. So you may notice that borehole four at the bottom is located away from the other three and the idea of that was when we encountered the coal we just wanted to see if we could tie in in the other boreholes and just confirm that regional dip of four degrees. So then we went to site. 
So we started off with our first borehole and the driller managed to get a dynamic probe all the way down to 15 metres before we broke one of these rods. So we kind of figured out early on we probably weren't going to get the grand investigation, the grand model that we thought we were from the desk study. So I asked the driller to continue with the CP rig and he managed to get all the way down to 30 metres and he's still in glacial till. So picture one there just shows the glacial till from a disturbed sample at 29.5 metres and you can see it's a clay matrix with a, sand, a yellowy sandstone cobble there and we've got grey mudstone in there as well. Just before we finish the borehole I asked him if he'd just do an SBT just to confirm and as you can see in my finger there I'm holding coal. He went straight through glacial till into some coal. I asked him to carry on drilling and he went through a one metre thick coal seam between 30.5 and 31.5 metres. Once he got through the coal seam, we couldn't go any further, so we brought a rotary rig on just to confirm that we were on bedrock and that wasn't just a big cobble. Um, and as you can see, picture four there just shows the um, mudstone bedrock that was underneath, just confirming that we had hit the rock. So we drilled two more boreholes. Unfortunately, they got down to 30 metres. We did SBTs and they terminated, still within glacial tail. Our fourth borehole, we um, got down to 27 and a half metres and the driller insisted he couldn't go any further. I made him chisel all of the afternoon and he still wouldn't budge. Uh, so we brought the rotary rig on and we were hopeful that we had some rock. Unfortunately, it was just another cobble. And we went all the way down to 30 metres and picture five there just shows the, um, uh, gla the glacial till that's been extruded from the liner. And you can see there we've got a clay matrix and there's different cobbles in there. And it just looks a bit wet, but that's just because of the water flush that we used. Generally, the till across the site was stiff. Uh, we had a bit of firm at the surface where it was weathered and isolated occurrences of depth where it was very stiff. So if I'm to put the two cross sections by, by, side by side, so that is our desk study cross section and this is our ground investigation cross section. You can see the difference there is the thickness of the superficial deposits but also the fact that we only encountered one coal seam. So when I was on site I originally thought the coal seam that we'd encountered was the main coal seam and that depth of 14 metres that they'd given us in the desk study was incorrect. However, when I got back to the office, I got the geological map out and had a bit of me uh, messing around. So using trigonometry in that regional dip of four degrees, I realised that what we'd actually encountered was probably the main coal seam. The desk study said we should get that at about 30, 30 point, within 30 metres. We got it at 30.5, so that's quite similar. So that lead me, led me to think, what has happened to the main coal seam? Where has that gone? Why didn't we encounter that? So this was a 3D ground model that we produced to help the client understand because they couldn't get their head around. All their planning documents said there was coal under the site and we just there was no evidence for it. So we made this picture just to show that it wasn't just underneath the site. In fact, it's the wider area. There is um, a significant thickness of till here. And so what I did was I started to look at the wider area and say, what, what's caused this? So our site is where we've got the red dot next to borehole 2. That was where we got the borehole with coal in it. And I looked at wider um, BGS borehole logs in the area just to sort of see if I could build a picture. There is more, there is a higher proportion of logs available on the BGS. However, there's not a lot that actually have the superficial deposit thickness in, so there wasn't a lot to choose from. But this is a generally what I found. And you can see if I start to add in the colours there, it looks like our site is on the limb of a paleoglacial valley. And what I actually think has happened is uh, when the glacier... During the last uh, ice age when the glaciers have come through, I think it's eroded the Pennine Middle Cool Measures and particularly that main coal seam underneath our site and has replaced it with glacial till. And as you can see, our borehole isn't even the deepest. It actually, I think that borehole in the middle is about 58 metres of till. So potentially what we think we've proved here is an inaccuracy on that 1 to 50,000 geological map for Durham. So what does that actually mean for our development though and what does that mean for the school? So if we had encountered the... Um, ground model for the desk study um, where we potentially had shallow coal seams and multiple coal seams it's likely that we might have had to remediate the ground and we probably would have had to, to um, concrete that using a ground, grout, grout curtain and if those coal seams were shallow it's, po it's possible we might have already um, also had to pile through those uh, into the competent bedrock below but because we didn't because we did the ground investigation and because we found it's actually the till was a great sorry the coal was at a greater depth and we've got that significant thickness of till we believe that we don't actually need to recommend any remediation and actually we can just recommend shallow foundations and there is no need to remediate that site so just a sort of closing statements there i think what this sort of this case study highlights is the, doing the important is the importance of carrying out ground investigation if we had and if we had just used the desk study that was provided in the, sorry, if we'd used the ground model that was in the uh, desk study, 
then the client would have had to spend a lot more money, time and effort to trying to come up with a solution to remediate that ground in order to build this new school. However, because we spent a little bit of money on the ground investigation and we pushed to change the rig when we encountered different ground conditions, we've been able to recommend that the client that they can potentially remove the risk pot of money that they had associated for remediating the ground because we just don't have any evidence to suggest that that needs to happen. And I think this is particularly important on small jobs where the budget for ground investigation is always squeezed and tightened, whereas we found actually the importance of just fighting a bit, we've been able to save the client money in the long run. And as I mentioned before, we think we've potentially proved an inaccuracy on the map here. It would be great to compare that maybe with the 1 to 10,000 map, which we didn't have access to, but it's, this is what we go to site for to see what we can find. So on that note, thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, hi, I'm uh, Kia Thomas, and uh, I work for a small consultancy called Geotechnology, uh, based in South Wales. And I'm going to talk to you today about a project that I was working on throughout uh, sort of 2017 and into early 2018. Uh, I've had to remove any reference to the name of the site or the parties involved because of concerns about blight on the development. So, uh, yeah, so we're stuck with this big but specific at the same time uh, name. Uh, so the site is a residential development, uh, 240 properties. Uh, they like to uh, like to cram them in on the site. It's a fairly well known uh, large house to house builder. Um, the site is located within an existing residential area and uh, some land is uh, given over to industrial use but generally generally housing uh, uh, with some agricultural land off to the uh, off to the one side of the site uh, here's the geological setting so uh, you can see our site here outlined in uh, in red on the uh, on the right hand drawing the site is actually located here on the uh, thematic geological map in this complex area. So over in the, uh, the east, you can see we've got the Mercia Mudstone. This is uh, a unit which is comprised of um, mostly mudstones, but also conglomerates and breccias, uh, some dolomitized, and that is given over to, uh, given to solution, um, dissolution features. And then most of the site lies on the St Mary's Well Bay member, which is a unit of interbedded limestone and shales. They're quite thinly interbedded, and near the surface, we tend to find that the shales have been weathered to a uh, sort of medium to soft clay. Uh, we've also got this third unit, which is the Panath group. It's a marginal fasces, so it's not always present. And uh, that is present beneath the eastern part of the uh, eastern part of our development site. So we weren't the first uh, people to be uh, first company to be involved on the site. Uh, there had been a previous desk study and two phases of ground investigation. So the ground investigation had focused on this area and this area, where desk study had uh, identified that there were potentially solution features. Uh, this area in yellow is a former MOD munition site um, that is being dealt with separately uh, to this project. But uh, yeah, so a rash of uh, a rash of boreholes have been carried out here, and boreholes and trial pits here. Neither of them had found conclusive evidence of solution features, although uh, soft ground to significant depth was found uh, found in this area. Those studies, uh, the reports associated with them, had basically been shelved by the uh, by the housing developer. Uh, they ticked ticked a box to say that they had their desk studies, and satisfied themselves with that without really considering the uh, the implications of it. Uh, so we were then called in uh, initially just to carry out some soakage testing and soil sampling uh, for soak away design and for materials management of the. Um, of the topsoil. Uh, as part of this, we were asked to sort of review and summarise the data from the previous investigations, which was when we picked up that they may have an issue with uh, with solution cavities. 
uh, we highlighted this to the client, um, asked if they could provide us with some more information on sort of the design levels for their uh, uh, for the site, so that we can compare this against our geological model that we'd built up from our limited ground investigation and the, uh, the previous ground investigation. Uh, so, using that info, we uh, we developed this uh, conceptual model of the site. So, uh, this very thin soil cover, there, there are no superficials mapped in the area. So, we're talking about probably three, three, four hundred millimeters of just topsoil material directly overlaying the uh, bedrock. So, the bedrock, we've got the, uh, the limestone and shale over here on the western part of the site. That gives way to two to three metres of green mudstone in a highly weathered state, uh, which is underlain by a purple mudstone, which is more competent. And then another two metres of interbedded sort of limestone shales and mudstones. Then we get onto this sandstone. This is the Corolla sandstone, which we identified in the desk study as having the potential for solution features. Unusual for a sandstone, but it's not cemented with silica. The grains are cemented with calcium carbonate, so it is prone to uh, dissolution. Uh, so we generated this, uh, this conceptual model to, uh, to show the client and point out that they, they may have a problem here that needs to be addressed before they can develop. Uh, they were reluctant to do any more, having already done two, uh, two ground investigations previously. So we then went about the process of uh, creating a cut and fill isopackite of the uh, development levels to existing ground, uh, sorry, against uh, rockhead, which is roughly equivalent to existing ground. And fortunately or unfortunately, we found that in this area where they had the potential solution feature, uh, there's a large area of cut uh, in order to bring uh, bring the access road into the site. So rather than plowing ahead with uh, further investigation, which the client was reluctant to do, uh, we said that we'd have a watch and brief while they were excavating in this area to see if, uh, see if they encountered anything suspicious. Uh, when they did dig into this area, we found these. So you can see here on the left-hand side, that was the, uh, the first sign of it as the excavator cut in. It just clipped onto the top of this uh, this cavity. Um, various things were shoved into the cavity to uh, see how deep it was, and uh, then eventually it was opened out. You can see the site manager here stood next to it. So the cavities are around two and a half to three meters deep, and there we've got a drone survey. So we're not talking about huge cavities. These are not sort of Florida sinkhole type things where we've got tens of meters across but in the context of a small house you know that will quite easily compromise the uh, compromise the structure if it collapsed uh, you can see here in the wider shot here we've got our green mudstone the purple mudstone the uh, the interbedded uh, limestone shale and mudstones and then we're onto the uh, the Corella sandstone so it seems to be that it the decalcification is limited to the, the top, top few metres of the Corella sandstone, as once you get deeper down, it is actually silica cemented. Uh, so here's uh, just a revised conceptual model. A road cut in has just gone in and clipped onto the, uh, onto the top, of, uh, top of the cavities. This, uh, this did serve to sharpen minds with the clients, and they then give us the go-ahead to... Uh, uh, carry out some investigation. So we carried out four rotary boreholes on a uh, on a triangular grid, in order to get a good constraint of the uh, the geometry of the Corella sandstone, and then one cord hole which was carried out sort of further down dip to the west, uh, just to confirm the full sequence. We then used this to create uh, create this model of uh, rock cover over the top of the uh, the Corella sandstone which was then used to develop a series of risk zones. Uh, right, the, uh, borrowed this from Waltham. Um, so we were con uh, mainly concerned with collapsed dough lines and cap rock dough lines. 
uh, but also where the Corella sandstone comes to the surface in the east of the site, uh, buried door lines. So these are our three risk zones, so uh, developed based on uh, the crop of the uh, Corella sandstone. So zone B is where we determined we would need to carry out a drill and grout operation. Uh, zone A is where the Corella sandstone is at a, a significant depth, so there's uh, no need to carry out any remediation. Uh, the risk has been mitigated by reinforced foundations. And zone C, where we suspect the Corella sandstone is near surface and we may need bespoke foundation solutions. Uh, to remediate the uh, zone B, we carried out over 1,300 boreholes in total. Uh, these were at a spacing of three metres, uh, which was based on the, um, the foundation design given to us by the structural engineers. And these were then filled with a foam concrete. Foam concrete was used as opposed to traditional PFA grout because uh, there's no local source of PFA grout. So the foam concrete actually ended up being more economical for this, uh, uh, for the remediation. Uh, you can see here a plot of uh, the grout tick in the boreholes. So the green holes are where we hit uh, solid rock and the red holes are where we hit uh, cavities. Uh, so you can see we've got some large ticks. Uh, the most take in one hole was 33 cubic metres of uh, foam concrete. Uh, we then moved on to phase C, uh, sorry, uh, zone C, where we carried out an electromagnetic survey to try and identify the, uh, the depth to uh, depth to rockhead and any uh, solution features. Okay, and that's the, uh, that's the plan for that. Uh, there were other issues in that there's still the MOD site on uh, part of the site and that's summary any questions Sorry. okay thank you Thanks. all right afternoon everyone so today i'm going to be talking about the work that i'm currently doing in the second year of my phd which is looking at the platinum group element content of mantle plumes around the world and more specifically today, I want to talk about one particular location, which is the Tristan Plume in the Southern Atlantic Ocean. And the reason we're focusing on this is because it has a really interesting geodynamic environment in which it started its life as, as a continental plume and migrated out to the middle of the ocean. And as I'll go on to, des to describe, this is quite important when we're thinking about the metals that it might bring up with it. I'm based in Exeter, but I'm working with people in Exeter and Cardiff, and we're also working with the Bra Brazilian Geological Survey on this project. So today, my talk's probably going to be a bit more theoretical than the other ones that have been today, but it will be an overview of my PhD, and because I'm still producing data, it will be an overview of the background behind the Tristan Plume and what I'm hoping to do next in terms of lab work. So the aims of my project are to explore the variability of platinum group element, or PGE, abundances and geochemistry in mantle plume-derived magmas in different geodynamic settings. And the objectives are to use major and trace element geochemistry, osmium, tungsten and helium isotope data to compare and contrast plume properties. So that's all quite jargony. So the platinum group elements are a group of six transition metals. They have similar uh, chemical properties. They're very valuable economically and they're increasingly being used in a lot of alternative fuel um, solutions such as hydrogen fuel cells. So it's becoming increasingly important to understand these metals. But unfortunately, they're very rare in the Earth. They're focused mainly in the core of the Earth and the subcontinental lithospheric mantle, the CL SCLM, so we can't really go and get them from there. Um, mantle plumes are hot up wellings of material from inside the Earth, which transport material from the mantle up to the base of this crust and cause partial melting and volcanism on the surface. Now, Plumes can theoretically interact with the core and the subcontinental lithospheric mantle and perhaps sample some of these PGEs and bring them up into magmatic deposits. And indeed, the most concentrated PGE deposits in the world, such as Skergard in Greenland and Norilsk Tulnak, Tulnak in Siberia, are related to plume volcanism and large continental cratons. So ultimately, the crustal processes will be focusing these metals into mineable deposits, but we want to look at the mantle controls on these, this metal budget. And the hypotheses we hope to test are that deep plumes originating from near the core will be expected to have more PGE than shallow plumes, 
And secondly, that plumes close to or within the continental crust, or SCLM, will have different PGE ratios from purely oceanic plumes. And ultimately, we just want to see which geodynamic environments are conducive to make good PGE deposits. I'm happy to answer questions about either hypothesis later on, but today I'm going to be talking mainly about hypothesis two. We're going to be testing this hypothesis in one location, as I mentioned, the Tristan Plume in the Southern Atlantic. 130 year, million years ago, the continents of South America and Africa were conjoined. The Tristan Plume arrived at the bottom of the, the continental landmass, caused partial melting, and erupted a huge flood basalt province on the surface. This is known as the Parana Etendeca Large Igneous Province, or PELIP for short. Um, and after this period of time, the con possibly because of the plume, maybe not, but I don't want to talk about that today because it's too controversial, uh, the continent started to rift and the volcanism continued. So actually what you have is a trail of volcanism going from the continent out to the middle of the sea to the current focus of the plume. And it's this changing in dynamic environment that we're looking at. If you look at this in a cross section, you can see here the plume arriving underneath the continent, where we've got this potentially PGE-rich source available for the volcanism coming through. When you rift the continents apart, this isn't available anymore. So what, you, what we're trying to do is sample lavas from the continental sections and the ridges, the Rio Grande Rise and the Walvis Ridge on either side, measure the PGE differences and see if this influence of this SCLM is important to the metals that you can get out of it. And you can actually see the plume trails in, uh, on Google Earth. We've got the current focus, the Rio Grande Rise and the Walvis Ridge. So it's a huge structure. So the continental sections of the lavas, we're going to be focusing mainly on the South American side, because although there's 1.7 million cubic kilometres of lava belonging to the province, there's 15 times more in Brazil than Africa. And there's a bit more variety in the lavas, a bit more going on. So we're focusing on that. David Peat in the 90s consolidated all the work done up to that point um, on, the, on the, forma the lava formation in Brazil, which is referred to as the Serra Geral Formation. This is divided into high titanium lavas, low titanium lavas, and silicic lavas, and those are subdivided into smaller groups too. And what you see is the high titanium lavas are focused in the north, and the, low, the high titaniums are in the north, and the low titaniums are in the south. But despite this sort of simple geographic distribution, the stratigraphy is actually very complicated. And the, the current thinking is that these different chemistries of lavas were all erupting at the same time, rather than one sequence uh, changing in chemistry over time. And my supervisor had already collected rocks from the northern sections. So at the end of last year, we went to collect the ones we didn't have to run lab analysis on. We started at the coastal extent, sampling the Gramado type. We actually scaled the full, almost one kilometer depth of the lava sequence, sampling as we went on this absolutely terrifying road with lorries flying around it. So it was, it was an experience. We went onto the top of the plateau and finished the samples up there. And the lavas are actually really well preserved. There's these beautiful columnar basalts. And as geologists, we all love columnar basalts, so I had to put this in. So what we've ended up with is 92 whole rock samples from the Brazilian continental lavas, 20, around 20 core samples from the ridges in between. And we're getting 20 to 30 samples from the African site sent by a collaborator. And we're going to run geochemical analysis on all of these and measure their PGE. Now, I know what you're thinking, these all look exactly the same, which is a bit offensive to me, but really it's what's inside that counts. And when you look at the, the geochemistry, there's a, a strong distinction between all these lava types. You can see the distinction between the high titanium trend and the low titanium trend on these major and trace element discrimination diagrams. But what I find really interesting is when you look at the magma sources using some work done by Pierce and discriminating magma types, the high titanium lavas plot in a traditional plume chemistry, what you'd expect. The low titanium ones have continental signatures. So if we're talking about plume lavas sampling continents and some not sampling continents, this is our dichotomy here. We're going to be looking at the PGE, overlaying my data on top of this and seeing if the influence of the continent is important. My supervisor has actually done some work in the North Atlantic, because if you imagine the Atlantic opening in the Cretaceous, it unzipped in a northerly, a northwards fashion. And in the North Atlantic, it rifted Greenland and the UK apart. And um, there was actually a plume there too, pretty much the same situation as Brazil, coincidentally. And this is where Iceland formed in between the two islands it rifted. So my supervisor has done the exact same project that I've done in the North. And what she found that was, as you rift the continents, the PGE relative ratios systematically change from the onshore continental stuff to the oceanic islands. 
So ultimately, when I'm running my own PG analysis, I'm looking for a similar trend to this. I want to see a systematic change in the types of metals we're getting out of the lavas as the geodynamic environment is changing. So if I can get this diagram from my project, I'll be very happy. And we can comment quite effectively on how plumes are behaving underneath the continent. So I'm currently producing data. I'm running lots of different lab analysis. Um, we're doing XRF and ICP for a major and trace. And then in summer, I'm going to be doing my nickel fire assay, which is to measure PGE abundances. Later on in the year, I'll be doing some isotope work, which will help characterize the properties of the plumes a bit better. This is more in the grand scheme of my PhD, where I'm going to be looking at global plume signatures. But the Brazil Africa section is going to be a sort of sub-study by itself, but will contribute to the narrative of how plumes are reacting around the world, what metals they have, and how this relates to the plume properties themselves. So I'll just end with this view. This was looking right over the, towards the Amazon, pretty much, over the Paraná Basin. Um, it's so expansive, and we travelled for 1,500 kilometres, but it just it's, it made you appreciate the volume of this lava that I thought I'd travelled a huge distance sampling all these different lavas. We'd actually moved about that on a map because this province is absolutely huge. So I know I'm taking on quite a large task trying to comment on such a large volume of lava, but I'm looking forward to the challenge of having a look at these different geochemical trends and seeing if I can contribute to the already controversial plume topic. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> yep, uh, I'm here to talk to you about uh, lessons you uh, learned from the PALS classification system on the West Connects Road Tunnel Project in Sydney, Australia. Um, I'll be talking to you, first of all, give you an overview of my case study, the West Connects Road Tunnel Project, then the classification system, what we did on West Connects, and then hopefully some potential applications to the UK. So the West Connects project, um, West Tunnel, bleh, sorry. The road tunnel project is pretty big, basically. It connects central Sydney with its western suburbs and it's a fairly high value contract. In terms of the geology, it's pretty boring, really. Uh, you have layers of sandstone and shale interbedded. There's some laminite, some siltstone but it's all laid down in a very large Ganges-like system in the Triassic. And it's, there's very little going on tectonically, a couple of extensional faults, some late stage dikes, nothing interesting really. So the Pell's classification system, what it does is it takes those five, uh, two principal rock types and then divides them into five categories based on the degree of weathering. So one being fresh, unweathered rock, five being pretty much soil, uh, and the key thing about it is that it uses objective and measurable parameters, such as the joint spacing, the intact rock strength, and the amount of allowable weaker seams within the rock. So if I went a bit too fast, don't worry, I'm going to go through some examples now. So we have on the, on the screen here, there's two rocks, obviously. In the left-hand corner, we have sandstone, and the right-hand corner, we've got shale. So the sandstone there, it's got maybe two fractures on it, so there's pretty wide spacing on the fractures. It's got one seam, which is that shale band coming across the, the middle there, and, uh, but that's less than 1% of the face. And we can't gauge intact strength from a photo. What we do in the field is we'd go to the face, or closest we could get to the face, grab a rock, stick it in a hydraulic rice, vice, uh, ramp up the pressure until it broke, and that's what we call a point load test, and that'll give us an indication of the strength. So the, the shale, I appreciate it's a terrible picture because it's kind of black on black, but you can't really see any fractures. It's got a glossy finish to it, so it's probably not very weathered. So, and you can't see any seams, definitely less than 2%, so class one material. Okay, class three, you can see quite clearly that there's some more beds coming into the sandstone. You can see sort of other seams coming in. Um, again, we can't gauge intact strength, but it looks lower. And then with the shale, you can see that we've got uh, more fractures. Um, and those kind of gray squares on the top, there's a, they're head of bolts. They're usually put into the face to stabilize it. So it's a five meter long metal rod. So the fact that it's peppered with them seems to suggest that it's got a fair number of fractures in it. And then finally, we're basically dealing with soil at this point. It's maybe it's got some relic structure in it, some larger core stones, but essentially, uh, it's pretty weak stuff. Okay, 
that's very well and good, but how do we use this? So in WestConnex, we used it in two arenas, tunneling and pilot. So in tunneling, what we did was we, had, we excavated by road header. So if you don't know what a road header is, there's a picture in the top right-hand corner. Essentially, it has a big board picks, and it moves around and cuts whatever shape you want into the rock. Um, and then someone like myself would go forward, and the road header would pull back about five meters. I would go forward, and I would produce a sketch, similar to the one shown in the bottom left-hand corner. And then from this sketch, there, there are two reasons why I did this. Uh, one was because my job was to work out you know, what's going to fall out immediately, whether there's going to be a wedge failure, whether some, the bit of the roof is going to fall out, and if it's going to fall out in the next couple of days. And if it is, then we're going to put a bolt in that, or we're going to remove it from the face. And the other reason was we're getting maps every five meters of a tunnel progressing through rock. So we have basically got a time-lapse photography image of what the different bedding planes are doing. So we have a fairly good idea what's going to happen in the future. And all of this feeds into the engineer's consideration of what we're going to put as the support type. So the Pell's classification system is principally used at this point as it's used at the information gathering stage, but it's also used to communicate with the engineers and with the contractors who are going to excavate the tunnel. And because it's a well-known system, the engineer, you say to the engineer, I've got a class three material and uh, we've got a fault just cutting through there and we should probably do something about that. And the engineer has an instinctive idea of what a class three material is. Well, as on other engineering projects, I've had to sort of verbally describe the, quad, the, the rock class. And that means that you kind of lose the important details within the general bombardment of information. So the fact that it's clear and to the point is very useful. And for the contractors, it's a similar story. They know exactly what tool they need to excavate that rock. For piling, there's a requirement in Australia that there be a geotechnical engineer or um, engineering geologist present to log the arising. So basically a big auger goes into the ground, screws down, and then it pulls up all sorts of rock dust and stuff like that, and you sit there and log it. Now, the reason why you do that is to make sure that it reaches the right depth and the right unit to get its strength. So in the, in the UK, when I've done pile logging, um, there's no hard and fast definition between soil and rock. What usually happens, and usually at the design stage, is you draw a sort of imaginary line across the, the weathered zone, usually quite close to the bottom, and you say above this line it's soil and below this line it's rock. Now this doesn't account for the proper strength of the material because if you're above that line you're discounting the core stones, you're discounting the relic structure that will probably actually give you quite a reasonable amount of strength on that and capacity to the pile. And then below that line, you could have a fractured rock head, which you're now saying is fresh material. So you're overestimating the strength of that. And generally, this uncertainty means that you have a longer pile, which means more concrete, more reinforcement, more time, and more CO2 released into the environment. In Australia, because you know exactly where you are in the weathered sequence, they target particular weathered bands. So they'll say, go to class four or above. So you go down there, you get your minimum depth, and that means that they have a realistic account for the strength of the pile, and they're using less material. Okay, so that's very good. It's nice to know what they do in Australia, but how does it help us here? So Pels, who devised the system about 20 years ago, said that we can use it in the Mercia mudstone and the Sherwood sandstone. Now, that's only because it's a similar depositional environment, and it's a similar time. Um, and... I think these classifications have already been subdivided by the BGS, and parameters have already been given to them by Syria guidance. So it's quite possible that we could build this up into a sort of robust system for categorizing weathered features in this zone, and therefore we can account for the strength of piles in this area and shallow foundations and so on. And so in conclusion, um, so there are some limitations. Um, we, it was devised for Sydney, and as I said at the beginning, Sydney is fairly boring. So we have largely homogeneous deposits, it's all flat and, flat and horizontally bedded, and then when you come across a vertical feature, the classification system doesn't really deal very well with that. So you have to manually downrate it, which is a bit unfortunate. But it's a very fast and effective means of communicating crucial geological information to engineers and contractors. It's dependent on measurable parameters, so anyone can come, pick up this, and use it, and they can easily classify and get the same answer. And it, it's very repeatable in very different environments. It realistically accounts for the strength of weathering profiles, 
And we've got 20 years of, of Sydney geologist experience where they've linked it with all sorts of engineering parameters, permeability, different uh, shear characteristics. So we'd, I mean, we'd have a very good bank of data to use in our engineering projects. So that's all I have to say. Does anyone have any questions?